Okay, we can call the meeting to order of the Deerfield Elementary School Committee on at 11 o'clock on April 9th, 2020. This is a virtual meeting. It is being recorded and streamed live. <clears throat> so now if I can get organized enough to read my agenda and everything set up. So uh, we will review and approve the minutes of March 11th, 2020. If anyone would like to make a motion to put them on. Oops. Make that motion, Trevor. Second. Trevor and Mary. Okay. Uh, any discussions or edits or concerns? Uh, hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote. All those in favor, uh, Kenneth Cutterback, yes. David Sharp. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Mary Raymond. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. I, and I didn't have my mic on, but I wasn't there, so I was actually the same, I think, right? Either way. Yes, that's fine. So we had 401. Sorry about that. Yep. Thank you, David. <clears throat> uh, financial statement and warrants. Does Shelly want to say something or anything? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to get unmuted. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I did share some information this morning electronically. I do apologize for the lateness with getting that out. Uh, typically, I would send it ahead of time, but you know, a little behind the gun today. Um, I did share the expense reports with you, so I'm happy to take questions if you have any questions on that. And I do not have any warrants to present on today. Um, as written in my summary, I am requesting that we move to designating one member of this committee to approve all bills, including payroll uh, warrants um, during this time. It'll also be helpful for us in the summer months and if we have any potential school closures for um, snow or other considerations where we have to cancel a meeting. Um, if we could have one person designated to sign warrants right. instead of all three, that would be great. Um, the other thing is, is we are looking to switch to an electronic warrant process using Adobe Sign. Uh, we started it with Waitley uh, yesterday. It worked really well. Um, what happens is, is we scan and upload the warrant si signature sheets and all of the bills into Adobe Sign uh, yesterday. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, and then you will have the rights to view them. The entire committee will have the right, rights to review them. Everyone can sign electronically if you would like to, but whoever is designated as that one signer, as soon as we have that signature, we'll go ahead and put it out to the towns for approval. Um, so for Deerfield, the town deadline is actually tomorrow at 9 a.m. So I would be looking to push out the first electronic warrant today. Uh, and have the designated person sign it by tomorrow morning so that Michelle can go ahead and get it down to the town. Um, I have used this process with Chicopee Public Schools in the past. They sign all of their warrants electronically. It gives committee members a, a longer time to review and ask questions through email if they need to, and just takes away some of that stress of if we can't get to sign them at a meeting, having people come into the building you know, and waiting a couple of days to coordinate schedules and putting you all out um, to do that. And then it also will give you more time to review. Whereas at school committee meetings, sometimes you don't have a lot of time to go through the actual documents. So, um, so uh, uh, just a question. This is Trevor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to sign if, pe if people need, uh, you know, I'm around most of the time. Um, but I, um, so w normally, we have the ability to go through all the bills and, and, and those can be rather a large pile. So is every bill getting scanned? That's an immense amount of work. Yeah. And, and right now there's not a lot of bills like yesterday. Um, I think Waitley only had five warrants and it was, you know, about 65 pages that we did have to scan into the system. And yeah. what I did was I identified the pages that actually needed signature. That way people knew what they were looking for within the document yeah. Um, yeah. so that you knew specifically where to sign. But yes, the idea would be that everything is uploaded into the system. 
Well, I mean, that'd be great, you know, to have everything digital from here on in. But um, that's just, a, yeah, there's a lot of scanning. So, well, so we make one packet, you know, and, and it does require some additional photocopying. Like if the bill is an abnormal size, you know, yes. it won't go through the scanner. So, yep. you yep. know, there there is a little bit more work on it from my office to yep. start the process. But Michelle was really easily able to print out last night when she had the designated person signature. She printed it out and it just made the process a yep. little bit faster, especially with us not being in the office. So sure, I sure. think it could yeah. really work out well. I think it's a great idea. So, yeah, I'm happy. To help. I think we the one thing I don't want to get be confused is we kind of hit two things at once. We really were approaching today to get a single a single signature to get us through this crisis period. Yep. While we're at the same time trying to get the digital signing at the same time. So we're doing kind of two things at once. One caught up to the digital signing caught up to us quickly. We were able to see Shelly was able to put that together, I think, a little faster than expected. Yep. Um, so it's kind of like we're we're designating one person to kind of be the sole responsibility to be able to go through them. Um, and then long term, this digital process yeah, might yeah. be the way the community wants, wants to go. So it's kind of two things are kind of coming at once. But really, when we came into this meeting, we just needed to have one person so we can get those those warrants out and get those bills paid, um, yep. especially during this time of isolation. So you know, yes. just in case people are kind of confused. So, yeah. you know, nope. when we get through this, we may want to adopt a system and then go to a three yep. signature um, process with the digital sign. But right yep. now we're asking for the single I guess for the next couple of months, um, yeah. the majority of the, the you know, majority of the warrants, uh, as we have, actually we'll talk about it, I mean, because we've frozen the budget, is payroll, um, which yeah. is more, straight, as you know, is more straightforward than the, um, right. you're looking at right. bills. So, so again, I'm happy to do it if anyone needs, but uh, what's up to you guys? Well, uh, I, I just had a um, couple of thoughts. Uh, number one is the motion that we make would be to approve a designee. Mm -hmm. And um, do we want language to say in a single signer designee in summer? I, I'm just trying to think. I guess we just have a designee. That sounds good. Um, I want to make sure that the designee we appoint is not up for re-election this spring so that we have to remember to take another vote on our first meeting after the election. Right. Um, so... That would be a comment. And Trevor, I know you're, you know, you're signing warrants at the town level on a regular basis. I think mm -hmm. I might personally prefer to have someone else on the committee doing it. That's completely fine. And yeah. um, and the final comment I have is I probably would not want to be the designee with the amount of, well, if I ever get back on the road, with the amount of travel that has been taking place since I've retired. So, mm. um any thoughts from other people would be appreciated. I'd be happy to, to be the signer. Great. Okay, so that's Carrie. Then I would entertain or ask, if it, is there anyone else interested in doing it? <laughs> I'm not hearing anyone jumping on the on the options. So um, if we David had a motion. It looks like he's trying to talk but might be muted. Oh, sorry. Mute thing is kind of funny. Sorry, um, I was just saying, um, is it possible to designate two people the authority to be the one signer? Because obviously, if Carrie's off some week, good question, David. Um, oh, he froze. Do you want to repeat that again, David? I'm just saying, do we people. want the motion to include the authority for one person to sign, but do we want people that individual authority to sign in case one of us, like, for instance, Carrie, is not available that week when she needs warrant signed? Have an alternate. I think that's a great idea. Frontier has that set up already. While they're not using the electronic process yet, they do have one designated signer with a backup. Yeah. Okay. Just, so we have Carrie as a designated signer, and I, I'm just trying to formulate a motion request here. Anyone want to volunteer to be the backup? I'm ha happy to volunteer. That'd be okay. great. So we have a mo I'd like to entertain a motion to appoint Carrie as our 
designated signer for warrants and um, and uh, David Sharp as the backup signer. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Sorry, I'm just uh, yeah. T and Carrie second. Any further discussion? If not, uh, we will go again to a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Um, Trevor McDaniel? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank Great. you all. Thank Thank you so much. Uh, so I will get the warrant put together. Michelle has already uploaded it to our shared drive. So I will get it into Adobe sign today. You will all get the message. You can all review and you can all sign if you would like, but Carrie will be the one signature that we'll be looking for. Um, so that'll go out. You do have to check. I learned from Waitley yesterday. If you have your frontier email forwarded to another address, it looks like Adobe sign does not forward. Um, there might be some security feature in there that I can work with Scott Paul on, but as of right now, they had to actually log into their frontier email address separate from their personal address to access the file. Yep. Um, and then you should be able to sign from there. Okay. Thank so you. Thank could you. I ask a couple of questions on the on the finances? Of course. So um, I just um, I noticed there was um, so just some adjustments I was looking at, like the um, the principal's office copiers was kind of yep. brought down quite a bit. I don't know if that was moved somewhere else. It was. If you look down, uh, actually, the next function code 2250 right below that, there's an addition of almost the same amount. Like 13. That yeah, that's the next one. Yeah. I was gonna ask in field uh, yep. administrative technology support. OK. Yep. Yeah, that sounds good. And then um, I saw a reduction in uh, I wasn't sure what EC teachers are. Um, that's early childhood. childhood. OK. So there was a reduction there of 17, but I didn't know if that was moved somewhere else or just. It was. So it was moved to um, function code 9100, which is on page six. Okay. Because we needed to increase our tuition for out of district students. Um, okay. and I think what we did was moved some of that money, some of those salaries onto um, school oh, yes, choice. I see. Yep. I see it here. Yep. Yeah, um, I, that was the other question I had. So perfect. <laughs> That's good. And then um, the early childhood IAs looks like it's spent down quite a bit. Um, and do we still have enough in that budget, like for the rest of the year? Or are we? Um, are you looking at general fund, Trevor? Or are you looking, uh, I'm at, looking at school uh, choice? I'm looking at uh, functions under substitutes, uh, 2325 salaries, early childhood IAs. Um, I think we're we're underspent that line item a bit. Uh, overspent. It looks like by twenty two fifty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think uh, we're still in good shape for the rest of the. Yeah. So that I'll have to take a closer look at that. Um, but what could have happened is if we'd had a change of staffing and someone who's making more money than their predecessor. Moved in. Yep. You know, that would change some of it, but I, I think sure. we're still in okay shape, but that okay. would be the explanation. Yeah, that's great. That sounds good. Um, and then uh, let's see. I was, I think the only other thing I saw was under um, other instructional services were, were pretty like right down to the wire as well. Yeah. And some of that is from last summer. Um, yep. Can you tell me what page you're on or what function? Oh, that was page four. At? Yeah, page okay. four, uh, item 22440. Uh, 2440, okay. Yeah, but it, yeah so that, that other support services, some of that is summer programming that got yep. overextended last year. Yeah, that's what we was finishing up some of that stuff. Okay, that's good. Um, and I was just, the one question I had for the whole committee was, um, you know, our transportation, I, you know, we're, we're, everything's paid out and just like 3,300 bucks in the balance. Um, but I, maybe uh, Darius might know, are, are they, are we, is that just paid and are, are, 
is Gripto going to do any kind of a rebate if he doesn't have to truck anybody for the rest of the year? Um, we are currently in negotiations with Gripco Transportation. Ken, myself, and Bob Halla from the Frontier oh, okay. Committee um, are in conversation. So hopefully I have information by the end of the week on that. Well, okay, even by tomorrow. We, we've exchanged emails today. Okay, great. Thank you. And That's it. Trevor, one additional comment on that. Um, yeah. Even though it is encumbered for 34000 it yeah. doesn't mean that we've paid them yet. We're just holding that money. So I see. Yep. If we are able to negotiate a rate reduction during this closure, some yep. of that encumbrance will get freed up because we won't be paying as much. Gotcha. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's all I got. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Trevor. Any other questions for Mary? I mean, Shelly. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I don't know if that's a Freudian slip or what. <laughs> Been doing this too long with you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, hearing no other questions, we can move on on the agenda to public comment. Do we have any members of the public out there today? If you choose to make a public comment, please state your name and where you live and uh, then go from there. Do we have any public comment? Oh, I'm taking the silence as an indication that there is no public comment for this meeting. So thank you. Um, unfinished business, COVID-19 update. Mr. Modesto. Sure. Um, I think the, the one thing we, uh, I think Shelly kind of skimmed over, I, I don't know if you said it and I wasn't listening or you skimmed over it, that we did freeze the budgets um, currently. Um, as uh, in obviously the principal can override the freeze and if there's necessary items, but trying to get starting to build savings on, um, you know, on stuff that we aren't you know, obviously spending on this, this, this year. Um, Tina's going to give a kind of an overview of what's going on with the, with that's going on in the, in the education, what the teachers are doing and such. Um, so she's kind of leaving the, leading the charge there with her crew on that. Um, and then we'll kind of come back around and start talking about the business end of things, which is not as pleasant as we look at the economic forecast. So um, maybe we should start with the positive. So if I get you, know, you to kind of jump in as kind of your principal report slash, I think because I think your principal report is your COVID report um, and, and all the great things that are happening in our school. Yeah, I'd be happy to give you guys a little summary of what's been going on in the school. Um, first, I think I'll just start with a quick facilities update is that our water uh, bottle filling stations have been installed during this closure. I haven't had a chance to see them or even use them, but I know that the kids will be excited when they come back to have those installed. Right. So, um, as you know, our remote learning pro programs are up and running. Um, one of our top priorities or a lot of our few of our priorities and missions during this remote learning is safety and the well-being. Um, of every, all our community members and, and connections. And so we're aiming to keep the DS students' academic minds active, engaged, and curious. With much of our learning and communication shifting to the online format, we've uh, loaned over 80 devices to children in pre-K to six um, because we want to ensure that everybody has access. To maintain some connections with families, we've held family information nights, uh, kind of dividing up the building into three uh, great three sections and providing three different um, opportunities for families to join. And we had a panel of administrators. We had the curriculum director, um, director of special education, school counselors, and the nurses on hand to share information and to answer any family questions. Great. We've also shifted from um, a monthly email update that I provided to a weekly email update for families. Teachers are providing weekly schedules and offering office hours. Teachers are meeting with me and they're meeting in teaching teams weekly and working together to meet all the needs of students. They're providing whole group and small group instruction. Instructional assistants have been creating video lessons. For small group. I'll get it after this. No, it's not. It's actually not my phone. That's my phone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, they're they're running small groups. They're popping into Google Meet sessions and they're reaching out and connecting with students and families. 
two initiatives that we have on tap for uh, kind of community connection is we're hoping to schedule a, a caravan uh, for, of teachers for late next week to kind of increase joy and lift the spirits. And we're simultaneously going to be sending out a slideshow with some positive messages from the DES faculty and staff to students and families. So that will happen late next week. Um, feedback loop, we are constantly soliciting feedback from teachers and families. I just sent a survey out to families this week. Um, you know, this is new for us. So we're, uh, we're kind of making revisions and, and um, changes as we go. And honestly, everyone, students, families, teachers, instructional assistants, our amazing IT department, our curriculum director, Darius, everyone has really risen to this challenge and surpassed the expectations. Um, I don't know, you, you know, we transitioned to remote learning in such a, a sudden shift. We had um, Friday, we closed school, and by Wednesday, teachers were up and running. So um, everyone rose to the challenge. They moved mountains. Uh, we, they reschooled and retooled. Teachers have been in webinars trying to figure out technology. And it's not just one thing. I was talking with some teachers today, and I was trying to add Pear Deck slides. It's an interactive Google slide program. And in order to do that, you have to have a Google Classroom. So it's not it's not as easy as learning like one platform. There's always like three more steps along the way. So they they have made that shift. Um, and you should just understand that they have what they've accomplished is truly impressive. So we're up and running and they're doing a fabulous job. Sounds like snow days are a thing of the past. <laughs> <I know. laughs> well, Lizard Google Meets. <laughs> right, exactly. That's great. I'd just like to jump in as a parent, Tina and everyone in the school. We, I, I've just been so impressed with how the engagement and support and the teaching that's been happening. Um, I, I can't imagine how hard and difficult the, you know, new this is for everyone. Um, but the teachers, the administration, and everyone in the buildings is, it's been really great. So thank you. We that's appreciate great. it. Great to hear. Yes. I, and you said the water stations are in place. Are those just, what are they specifically? They're the just water bottle filling stations. So it they went over our um, water fountains themselves. So you okay. can fill the water bottles. Right. So it's not a, a standalone item. It's not something that has an annual maintenance plan or anything so associated with it. Or I think there's filters know? associated with it. But other than that, right. The typical maintenance that you would have in a um, bubbler. Right. Yeah, it's, no, one, it's I, one of those hydration stations, Ken, where you can fill bottles and get drinks right. and it go through a filter as well. So, yeah, no, I yeah. assume that I had had some quote donated to my school at one point in time and ended up with about a $3,000 a year maintenance plan on it. So I had oh. them removed shortly after they were donated. But that's that was my main question. I assumed it was just the, the standard filling station with a and filter that can be easily changed by our staff and and there's no heavy duty maintenance required with them so correct okay we use great we use the same models that frontier had been already put in place and some other schools have already put in place so okay thank you and uh and i do want to add um to carrie's opinions or you know comments I, i'm just blown away by the reaction time for the union and the region uh, to this whole situation and learning on the fly, essentially. Uh, it's been amazing to watch. So yeah. congratulations. Yeah. So. You're absolutely right, Ken. It, it, the, the amazing uh, shift in how quickly we did it compared to neighboring districts um, really, has to, really is a tribute to the hard work of, of the administration and the teachers. Right from that Friday where we knew Something was going to happen the following week. Um, the teachers got on board um, and the flexibility. I would say the two things that, are, that have been wonderful about it is the flexibility and understanding that this is evolving and let's not, um, let's not get stuck in the cement of the different par parts of the, you know, the concerns and those kind of things. Let's try to find, figure out ways to get through it. And then also the individualization within the district, teachers reaching out and making sure that the families are, you know, from getting food to, feeling safe, emotionally well-being, and then going into um, individual needs. And, and we're still fixing. There's still a lot of things that we're, you know, this thing is a, is unknown territory and uh, um, we still have a lot of work to do, but I think we've kind of gotten through the first big hurdle of it. And now we can kind of um, 
see how this rolls out over the next few weeks. Yes. Yeah, very exciting. I want to thank everybody who's been a part of it. It's free from our kitchen staffs who've been feeding um, in, a, in, a new, in a new way, our custodial staffs who have to clean in a new way, and then, of course, all our teaching staff, um, teachers and administrators who are putting out an excellent program. So thank you to everyone. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, one f further comment is I'm noting, you know, we are, we are having our meeting, but if you look, you'll see that there are 21 people on in this meeting, if you have the ability to, and I'm seeing a lot of names of staff and faculty, um, which uh, is is also great to see. I mean, you yes. know, it's not like they don't have anything else to do during the day, but uh, to be willing to sit in and listen to us is is showing that they are truly connected. Thank you. Mm. So, um, so anything? the other side. You want to talk about the other side of the coin? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So Thanks, the flip Dina. side of things at the school committee, I, and I think this is, you know, I, when I put this meeting together last week and I said, really, the each individual's committees have to get together to talk because we made some decisions as a joint committee about paying people through revolving funds. I want to make sure Deerfield does get hit hard um, by this decision in the sense, and Shelly can, in a moment, um, kind of jump in and we can go through those things and, and how we're going to have to make up for some losses there as we pay um, those people with those revolving accounts. Um, at the same time, we've also got a request from the town to reduce our budget. Um, Trevor, I'm gonna ask for you to comment on that as well in a moment, um, because originally they asked for a $30,000 reduction in our budget. But I also know that we're all- At the same time, we've also got a request from the town to- yeah, so Somebody needs to mute. Well. On that Sandy well. Buddha, if you could if you could mute your um, if you could mute, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so um, you know, we, they've asked for the initial thirty thousand dollar reduction from our budget, which you know um, Shelley can talk about how that's kind of been compounded by this this uh, this spring's um, use of revolving funds, and that we're going to have to replace. So we just kind of have to talk about where we are right now, and then. Um, where I was going to ask you to comment, Trevor, is that there is a concern that the, the economics from the state could be down as, you know, Sunderland is concerned that it might be down as much as 5% um, reduction from the loss of tax revenues and local revenues um, due to businesses and people being unemployed and whatnot. So we may have to be looking further. And so it's kind of really a time for us to kind of firm up where we know our budget is now. Um, we have, you know, Deerfield does have a lot of different moving parts. Um, and you know how um, I, I, my recommendation is that we make no drastic moves until we have a very clear vision of what the numbers are coming because they may ask for more or they may ask for less and we don't want to kind of get ahead of um, the facts that we have in hand. So that's, yeah. but I do want to make sure everybody's very much understands where the numbers are, where we're at, yeah. so that when we do have to make adjustments, if we have to make adjustments, we'll be um, positive here, um, we kind of know where we're all starting from. So that's why I was hoping this yeah. next part of this conversation can go. Sure. So just um, just to <clears throat> recap a little bit uh, from the town end, um, before COVID hit, um, we were already, you know, facing, uh, you know, a pretty pretty sizable deficit for the town budget. Um, so we we um, we've been working on this budget for months, trying to get it get it to where we were. And I, I know the school committee did a great job, kind of coming in at a at a great spot. Um, you know, we hope to kind of stay there. And then when we finally got all the expenses and looking at the revenue coming in um, right before this COVID thing hit, we, we were um, we were about $170,000 in the hole. So all the department heads kind of pulled everything together. We pushed off capital projects. We, um, we had everybody go through all their budgets and trim where they could. So every single department ended up, you know, taking some of their um, their budget away uh, just to try and, you know, all, all teams, uh, you know, on board to try and reduce that amount. Um, so then we we got to a point where we wanted to request out to the schools, um, you know, Deerfield and, and Frontier, if they could if they could um, look at their budgets and maybe pull about 30,000 out of each of those budgets. And I know Frontier, that's a much larger amount. Because it's all the towns. So that's kind of where we were at. And we felt like if we could do that going into next year, um, while it would still be a tough year and everything would be really tight, we thought we'd be in good shape. And then all of a sudden COVID-19 hit. And um, so just all of a sudden we weren't gonna have the revenue that we would normally get from 
you know, food, meals tax, rooms tax, all these kind of things that you'd normally get, you know, excise tax for people buying cars. And, you know, we just we're unclear. And then on top of that revenue, we kind of understand that the state also is getting no revenue. So they're, they may have nine C cuts and other, you know, they may have to make other reductions. So we're, we're kind of in a holding pattern too. Like I agree, like don't make anything drastic. Everybody's kind of waiting on the state right now to figure out what they're going to do. Just before we got to COVID-19, we were in a bit of a trouble. So um, that's kind of why we made that initial request. And then we're just hoping that the state, you know, gets some federal help and, you know, that it wouldn't be a dramatic cut to us and we can kind of keep rolling on. We really wanted to support all the employees, you know, um, through this mess, you know, it's no fault of their own. Um, we're all just kind of trying to get through it together and making sure everyone's supported and, and, and getting paid still. And, and, and certainly they have worked, you know, almost double what they normally would work getting all this stuff up and running in the, you know, all, I know all the staff at town, but mainly, you know, obviously all the teachers and administration, everybody's worked double time, you know, to get this through. So we, we just felt it was right to pay everybody all the way through that. So that's kind of where we're at right now. I, you know, I could answer any questions or, but you know, that's kind of the, we had this, you know, this trouble beforehand and then, and then we COVID-19 hit. So we're really unsure what's going to happen. Yeah. And when I say we have to pause to see what's going to happen. So, you know, you look at the $2 trillion um, numbers and I talked a little bit about this at the joint meeting, but the numbers are now even less coming into Massachusetts. It's in the, it's in the millions instead of billions, um, I believe. Um, and let me, let me see if I have the number here. The other concern is that, you know, everybody was waiting for the SOA money, the Stu Student Opportunity Act, but well, that was subject to appropriation. Yep. So now all of a sudden you had the Student Opportunity Act where all these districts were planning on using all this new money coming in from the state. Now the, the state's gonna have to decide how much of Student Opportunity Act are they gonna fund and understand that we didn't get a lot of that. Right. And so right. then you're gonna have the adjustment of other funds coming from the state to those urban areas that now are, a lot of money is being taken away from and how is that gonna trickle out into our community? Um, the federal stimulus money, uh, but the, I'm not sure it's called stimulus money, but the federal money that's coming in toward education is going through Title I. We don't get a lot of Title I at Deerfield. Um, you know, shall I even have a roundabout, an envelope number on that, but it's gonna be a few thousand bucks, um, maybe more to offset there. But that, that Title I money usually goes to more urban areas. So that, that's not coming in right away. So it really does, you know, the questions are, you know, are they going to use the rainy day fund that they have in Massachusetts? How much are they going to use it? How much are they going to apply to education? How much are they going to hit small town, you know, towns with it? So those are all the kind of questions as we read the newspaper articles um, as it rolls out. Um, they were supposed to have a meeting on Tuesday. Um, it gives kind of an economic briefing. They had technical difficulties, and so they postponed it a week. My gut says they postponed the week because they didn't have enough great information anyways, and they probably wanted to wait another week on top of that. But um, that's that's what my gut says, because it doesn't take a week to fix Zoom. Um, but yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe it does. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think Shelly, she could probably walk through about the concerns regarding the revolving funds, just to make sure everybody has any, make sure everybody understands where we are there. Um, and kind of just kind of get up to speed there. Does that sound good, Shelly? And, and just to jump in real quick before Shelly, just to, uh, we took a vote um, at the select board to move town meeting to um, June 1st. So it gives a little, you know, gives us a little bit more time, you know, to work on this budget. But I just wanted to mention that to everybody that town elections would be June 8th and town meeting would be June 1st. So it gives us a little more time. And it's my understanding that you want that 14 days prior to town meeting. We should have a firm budget in hand. Yes. That, that's kind of what I heard yesterday from Sunderland. Yes. I, I think that's accurate. I'll get an answer from uh, Casey and Barb on that, but that'd be helpful. I'll make sure to get back to you on that. Um, so to answer the Title I question, Darius, we do get some funding in Deerfield. However, compared to other districts, we do not get much. Um, we get about $30,000 and that does support um, salaries and wages for the teeter, teacher who is um, involved. So it's not a lot, but it's something. So Deerfield actually might see some money if there is some relief that comes in, but it, it certainly won't be, you know, anything that's really going to be helpful to us, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And Darius, there's one other concern for FY21 that you didn't talk about that I hope I'm not um, overstepping. 
by mentioning here, but I do think we need to talk about it, which is that new um, out of district placement. That's a possibility for next year. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and present my screen because I, I created a little document that I did not share prior to the meeting. Okay. Somebody, if you can let me know when, when it's up, if you can see. Yep, it's up my now. Screen. Okay, great. Um, so just as a reminder of what our approved budget is that was approved at the March, early March meeting, I believe, we were looking at a 2.9% increase um, and our total town appropriation there of just under $5 million. Um, so I outlined three of our concerns that have developed since approval of that meeting, uh, approval of that uh, uh, budget. Um, the first is their early childhood revenue loss from FY20. Um, and what I did here was create a little chart for us to look at. We are looking at a $36,000 revenue loss. And the reason I think that this is important to look at is because we are going to have some decisions to make about the savings that will be able to be realized from our budgets being frozen this year. Um, it's easy to see here that at the end of this year, we were looking to roll over $38,000 to FY21. Um, with the revenue loss, we're now looking at rolling over $2,400. And you can see what the ripple impact will be to the end of FY21 of, of the early childhood program, only having $6,500 left in their account. Now, that's not a, an amount that I'm comfortable with, um, but we could certainly make the decision to move forward with this model, um, they're not losing money, but they're barely making money, which just means that if we have any additional hardships next year, um, whether it's tuition, you know, we don't have as many enrollments and we lose some tuition, or if we have some unforeseen circumstance such as this, we won't have any backup revenue. Um, so one of the other considerations is to take the savings that we're going to be able to see from the FY20 budget, which I'm still working on with Tina, um, take those savings to help support the salaries this year so that the early childhood can maintain a higher revolving fund balance rolling into next year so that they do have a greater cushion. Um, the early childhood program is similar to uh, school choice, which we talk about a lot more frequently in that we don't want the account to be so close to having no balance that there's not a cushion for us if there's problems that come up. Um, the next piece is that we do have a child um, moving in from Hatfield. He currently attends the WINGS program in Conway, um, and it could be a potential out-of-district placement of about $50,000, which does not include any transportation expenses that could come up. Um, and I know that Darius and Tina had some conversation about um, the needs of that student and, and whether or not the DES program could meet that child's needs. Um, so I would defer to them in that regard, but I did want to bring that up that that is something that came up after approval of the budget. And then we have the town request for a $30,000 reduction. So those are the three pieces we're looking at right now. Um, the one last comment before I, I take your any questions or comments from you is that in regards to FY20, at this point, I need a couple of weeks to let the database and the PO system catch up. Now that we no longer have expenses um, happening, we don't have any new orders happening unless they're necessities. We need teachers to submit reimbursements for whether it's professional development, mileage, purchases that they've made. Um, we're working with secretaries to make sure that all of the POs are in the system. We're working with facilities to make sure that they have everything in. And then I can take a much closer look at what is left in certain line items to see what actually will be available for um, to help either this year or next year. So the question on the, um, so the child right now is in Hatfield, but attends Conway. Correct. I think it's, I think we have to be uh, more yes. vague on that. I, I think we Absolutely. Have to, uh, with, with student rights and such um, privacy rights, basically we have a, we have an outplacement um, that costs you know, around $50,000. That's going to be new to our district next year. We can okay. just keep those facts. Just, I'm sorry to talk over you. I don't want to guess. 
go down. No, no, that's fine. I was just trying to understand where the um, where the expense was. I, I wasn't sure. Do you think our our school could handle the needs? I guess we, that was the so question. basically again. I'm going to be vague in that area. So we will be looking at, we try to keep all students in house if we can. Um, right. We believe that keeping students in their own communities is, is the best model possible. Yeah. So, but when we have a student that's already has an IEP in place with an out, with an outplaced program, we, we adopt that IEP and then we, um, we have meetings with the parents and the IEP team to find the best placement for that child. Um, we're always trying to bring back people back into district. And this, I think, <clears throat> this opens up another avenue where we, where this is where we don't act like a Union 38 district. We act as a individual towns and, that's and what I was special saying. ed. And, and, and that's one of the things on our back burner that we've been kind of discussing about how can we, how can we act more as one district and these kind of things so that one town is not um, financially hit by one student where we can collectively absorb that together. Um, but but that, we're not in place to fix that yet. Well, that's what that was my uh, my confusion and why I had the question was I, I thought our district was was our um, our four towns, but I didn't realize that. OK, so that that was yeah. the reason for my question. I didn't, I didn't know that's how that worked. Yeah, no, this is um, this is something that's gone on for a long time in terms of if a program's run in one of the towns and and, you know, students move between the towns to attend these various programs and then there are tuition costs. Um, and, you know, I, Darius is absolutely right. We can't get too specific, but I also think we ought to need to let the administration put together their plan and find out what the tr final impact is on the budgets um, when we yep. get to when we get to that point. So I know in conversations with Darius that there are strategies being discussed. So okay. why don't we just leave it at that? That's so. perfect. So are, are so, we are we able to take the savings from potential if there are any from this year, Shelley? I guess and and um, sort of apply those to our next year's budget. Is that what I was sort of hearing as a possible suggestion, as opposed to the money just vanishing into the town in general? Well, so what we would probably do is reallocate our budgets in different ways. So perhaps something that we've spent from school choice already we would move some of our general fund back onto the general fund um, so that our school choice is available for next year in the end the bottom line is that we will end up supplementing next year's budget um, with any savings from this year unless we choose to pay the early childhood staff um, out of this year's savings that and then it won't deplete the early childhood account so that next year their account is in better standing. Um, okay, let me phrase it a different way then. I guess I was wondering, um, the town's requesting that we reduce, present a reduced budget for next year mm -hmm. by around 30,000. And is there any chance that our savings from this year are going to exceed that 30,000? Um, I don't know that yet. Okay. Um, and okay. I think because of the loss to the early childhood program revolving revenue this year, I still think we're going to be looking at ways to come up with a $30,000 reduction to the budget, even so David, with savings this year. So David, you're asking, what you're asking is a good question in the sense of when you're looking at the straight up numbers, but the issue is that the other two things that has happened since then since the initial request from the town for $30,000 is now we have an outplaced student that could possibly be $50,000 and we have a additional around $30,000 of early childhood that we're in the, that we're going to have to make up from another line, another from the general budget. Right. So our actual, our actual um, number is about $110,000 that we're going to have to make up from shifting different funds, whether or not we look at using more school choice or, where do we reduce the budget that we put on the table? But then the final concern is, is the 30,000 really, is the 110 number the full number? Meaning that, you know, is it gonna be really around 3% deduction because of the loss of tax revenue? So we're really at 150,000, 160,000. Right now, um, savings from, you know, freezing the budget may get us 30, $40,000, that's it. 
So then we're still going to have to be looking at about 100 plus in cuts or shifting of running things closer to the wire on some of these revolving funds where we have a little extra money, running a little closer to the wire on school choice, you know, and maybe a mixture of that. But until we get that final number, I think it's very important. You know, I kind of said this last night to the Sunderland committee. Each percentage, each percentage point, we react differently. We don't, we don't have a list of tools that we just kind of pick one off at a time down the list. But as we, we look at the total number, we design what tools we need to get to that number. So if that, if that makes sense, yeah. you know, yeah. leaving you that flexibility. You know, yeah, we have the, we want the, we want that flexibility because um, there, you get to a certain point that you're looking at staffing reduction, and then how does the staffing affect programming? And it's right. not just it's not just people; it's what the people do, and then how are we going to make up for that? So it's a bigger kind of picture when we get to that phase. But I think right now, I just want everybody to understand where we are right now, and then we're going to see where the state comes in to see how bad it really is. is. Yeah, yeah, how bad it is, you know, and then make our you know go from there. It, it does seem like there should be significant savings from the um, bus contract. Yeah. Not necessarily significant. No, no. Um, they're still have they're paying all of their employees still, um, and they still have all of their regular overhead. So we're looking at potential for some fuel adjustments, but yeah, that could be it. Well, okay, but then uh, are we privy to whether he's going to apply for uh, you know paycheck protection from the you know CARES stimulus package? I mean, I mean, you know. <laughs> Can't get it both ways. Yeah, I mean, you got to be. Um, you know, I understand. I mean, they. I un, I understand that we want to take care of people. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think we should do it because it's all budgeted. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering whether there's a slightly different analysis when we're talking about um, a private contractor. Um, uh, you know, who's clearly, there are clearly, there clearly have to be savings right now. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know, you're obviously in the middle of negotiating that, but I, I think that that is an issue. There need to be some oversight to make sure um, that there isn't, that if there's any double dipping, we are getting, we are getting the, the rebate or the refund. I don't disagree with that, um, David. As, as Darius has said, we are in negotiations with them, and um, at this point in time, they haven't given indications of any emergency measures they've taken or any responses they've taken to the um, incentives that are being offered to small businesses. So, um, you know, so we're we're still working through it. Okay. Yeah. So are we back to Darius, so, sir? Yeah, I think we've just had a holding, like everybody knows what we're looking for and we're at a holding pattern until we see from the state, right? And and so I'll just right. let everyone know at the town that we're just kind of hanging, hanging on and waiting to see what the numbers are, as we are too. Yeah, so I mean, as I see it is that we will have another meeting once we have the numbers. Um, I mean, imagine the state will release the numbers. We'll probably let the town digest the numbers and get their kind of interpretation of it. Um, and then we'll have another meeting at that point. We'll get you information ahead of the meeting as much as we can about, um, what the, what the numbers look like. And then, um, it'll be a lot. I don't know what I'm digesting here, but mm -hmm. the administration will have some sort of recommendation if there is a reduction, if, um, there isn't going to be an increase, but, <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> you know, but we can figure out, you know, um, what that looks like. I think, I don't know what that, when that will happen. It may yep. be a couple of weeks. Yep. Um, again, I think the whole timeline, I mean, they also talked about that the timeline for the, the state budget is not going to be like it, it has been in the past where you have the governors and the house and then the Senate, that they're going to have to more have to work together in order to get this thing rolled out. There's also some talk of them dragging their feet on it and going to a one twelfth. um, I don't know if you've heard on that from the yeah. municipality um, hearings, but going to a one twelfth municipal budget, basically running off of last year's budget uh, month by month until they can see the, or to be more concrete in predicting the outcome of what the economic um, 
um, outcome of, of all these closures and of the COVID effects, so to speak. So um, we're, we're, they're going to wait to go into July to do that and go to the 112 method and not have a budget um, to start off the new fiscal year. So there's talk of that too, but I think they're waiting to see. I think everybody's waiting to see what happens over the next two weeks. Yeah, you know? and we're trying hard not to do that 112 budget. Okay, is that it for a uh, budget update? Any, any other questions out there? All right, so I guess we would move on to new business. School choice recommendations. So basically we still have the, the legal requirement of making a decision before June 1st. And so I just kind of put it on these agendas as of a small small ounce of normalcy um but uh, <laughs> tina will present the uh you sent those out correct that the school choice numbers for um next year um the one thing that is on there is that they did change the law that while your school choice school you also if you close a grade you can no longer accept into that grade so i'm asked the principals not to close any grade but greater or less than one um if they only are asking for one or two people, because if we did have movement going in next year and you lost a few kids and you could take a, a single school choice or um, if a student moved out of town um, and wanted to stay as choice in the in the building with their, we would want to respect that. So we have to keep each grade level open to choice to at least greater than or less than one um, if the numbers change going into next year. So I'm playing a little bit with the law there, but um, is, the big is, thing is you're voting to be a school choice school and Tina's kind of showing you the the numbers looking at forecasting next year. Is that why the two kind of sheets came out? One was kind of zero and then it said kind of less than one? Yeah, yeah, what happened was, as I said, please get the school choice sheets out. They were sent yeah. out and I was like, whoa, whoa, hang on, I forgot to yeah. tell you guys, we need to at least have one in okay. each grade because that's that the, new, the, the new interpretation of the rules. Thank um, you. They, they've kind of tightened it up in the last, last year. Yep. Jeez, what are they catching up with us? Eventually, yeah. <laughs> Um, so as I looked at the summary, which I now has disappeared off my screen, I still am learning how to manipulate all these this information. Um, I think I came up with about a projected enrollment at this point in time about 302 students without preschool included, um, and I don't have a pre current enrollment sheet, so I, I don't know how that compares to this year. I was I scrambling. About 389 students. Shelly, do you have the, I didn't pull up the last projection. What was um, that number? What was that number? Well, okay. You I think can, she I, said 389. I, I, pulled it out of, I don't know where. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to tell you? So we run into this every year around this time. Right. How many people register? We are in line with the last three years that I've been here. It's been about 28 um, registered of natives, if you will, for oh, yes. kindergarten. It's the kindergarten number that's always with us. And right. with, between now and over the summer, we, we typically get in on average around 10 to 12 students. So I put 8 to 15 on there. So right. at this time of year, we always have that conversation around how many school choice, what are we going to do? Um, and we always talk about keeping the class sizes low because of the social emotional issues that we are seeing mm -hmm. uh, and then increasing as we go up. And that served us well. Yes. Okay. All right. Because um, I just, I mean, if the numbers in this kindergarten class were to stay at the current level, it would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I we have to vote to participate in school choice each year mm -hmm. um, in order to participate in school choice. And that's essentially what's being asked here. Do you need a vote this meeting? Yeah. OK. I would say just get out of the way. Basically, you're voting right. to be a school choice school. The, you know, the, the numbers on there, we've kind of always had a discretion of the principal, um, mm -hmm. but you're not closing off any class. Um, actually, the law, the, the new written law of it states, if you don't vote, you're automatically a school choice school. But we oh. Don't get out of that. oh well, it's <laughs> it's always good to reaffirm. So exactly, I, you're better off being proactive. I would make a motion that the Deerfield Elementary School um, 
participate in school choice for um, school year 2020-2021? Is that Mary seconding? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. <clears throat> David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. Okay, it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll move on to, it says first reading of the following policies, but we had discussed all of these policies last month, I believe, and the only thing we had asked was to have Darius double check language on B E D H, which is the only one I believe that's um, staying on the on the docket. So, although there's no votes required on the agenda, I would think we could possibly proceed with a vote to approve these the recommendations of the administration. But uh, you, I'll turn you, it over. Yeah, you are correct. Um, basically, what happened is I had Sunderland last night that canceled their last meeting, so they're behind on where they are. So I believe we just, we just made an error. Um, yep. and, and, and Conway doesn't mean until next week and they're still doing the first readings of, of these, <laughs> these, let alone the next, the next set. But no, they're still haven't voted the last set, let alone the next set. So um, that's, that's my off. That's my, my fault getting those confused. Um, we are not ready to vote the um, public comment one. So basically I had a conversation with Adam Dupree, our, your attorney, um, in regards to that, he had, when I asked him to change the language, because we want to have some discretion of the chair um, to keep it informal at times when there isn't there, he wanted to contact MASC because he disagreed with the some of the wording in there. Um, all right, Shelly, thank you. Shelly has to leave us, folks. Okay. She's got a, okay. uh, a meeting with Desi. For thank you, Shelly. Thank some you. Sort. Um, Great work, by the way. She's already <laughs> gone. Okay. Well, yeah, I know. We'll Poor Shelly. First I mean, year, five budgets, and she's got to do them more than once. She's awesome. She doesn't even know what, she doesn't even know what it's a joke amongst us. She's not laughing, but she doesn't even know what a normal budget cycle looks like. <laughs> so, yes. Great. Um, so, my recommendation is to do nothing until we get some guidance from our legal counsel on the, the public comment section. Okay. The other four are just being removed. I would recommend that you go ahead and just have those removed and get that off your off your yep. ticket of having it work done. That's it. That's kind of that was kind of my thinking. So um, good. I, I'm glad BEDH will be worked over a little bit more. The logistics of managing people signing up and everything has got to be pretty clearly defined in order to have it be consistent from meeting to meeting. Yep. Um, Do you want so to vote each why one? Don't I, well, no, why don't I approach it this way and look for a motion to um, remove policy IHA, JLA, JLD, and JP um, from the policy manual as recommended by administration. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Very second. Terry, Mary seconds. And uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Oh, I can't say that. I've got to go through the roll call. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. And Trevor McDaniel? Yes. It's unanimous once again. Thank you all for, for that. Um, and I think we're down to reports. Um, the chair really doesn't have any reports. Darius is in regular contact with me and I assume all of the other chairs, uh, on all of the various and sundry items. And I try and provide updates on anything substantive that comes out of those discussions. And, um, we have, that's basically all I have to say. I don't know if, Gary, if you've had any opportunities with the collaborative? Uh, we did have a meeting two weeks ago, uh, okay. COVID updates for the most part, uh, but there has not been a director's report issued since then. Uh, okay. So when I 
when he does email it out, I will forward it to all of you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we just, just FYI, the collaborative has been a part of all of our is helping host the principal meetings and nice. the uh, superintendent meetings up and down the valley. So I see I see Bill all the time, probably yeah. once a week or Excellent. twice a week. They're yeah. busy. They're doing a lot of good work over there. Yeah, they're yes. great people. They they always do. Um, and I believe we've heard Tina's summary and updates. Um, and Darius, you've provided your updates. I don't know if there's anything else to add under reports. And do we have an executive session need today? No. I wouldn't think so. So we are down to adjournment. I'll make that motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. And Kerry seconds. Well, it has been a, oh. And I'll just say, I think we can just do a voice vote on all yeah. in favor. Aye. 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 And that's all five. Thank you very much. And thank uh, you, the Darius. Next meeting, the only thing, Ken, is the next meeting, I will doodle you once I have um, doodles a program. Because that did not sound very good. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> I, will, I will call you. Uh, on the time and date of the next meeting, as soon as we get some information from the state, um, I imagine there'll be a flurry of emails and, and whatnot, and then we'll set up a meeting. I imagine at the very least two weeks. Um, yeah. Something that comes up prior to that, um, I'll be in touch. Okay. okay. And thank you so much to all the um, added names or added people who listened in on this meeting. And uh, thank you for your interest and your continued support of the Deerfield Elementary School. Yes. So yeah. thank you. Uh, with that, we will adjourn at